Now, thank you, loving Father, for your grace. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate the things which we study to the end result that the Lord Jesus Christ receive honor and glory and that believers receive all that you have provided for them in eternity past. In Jesus' name, amen. We are now progressed uh, looking at the, uh, the secondary personnel and unique assets which lie between your computer assets and your escrow assets. Computer assets depend on God. Election and predestination provides equal privilege and equal opportunity for every believer. There is no equality in the human race until you come to the cross, and there, there is true equality, and God has provided totally, uh, on the basis of his character, fantastic opportunities and privileges for you so that you could receive the escrow assets that he also provided for you in eternity past. Now we come to the, this is the big question mark, because these assets lie between your computer assets and your escrow assets. It's the, the variable uh, in the equation, and the variable has to do with the believer who perceives his primary assets, both the computer assets and the escrow assets, who understands what God has provided, and then makes the decision to utilize what God has provided so that he could get what God has provided for him in his life. Every believer has these computer assets. Whether you ever use them depends on your own free will and volition. If you use your free will and volition to go positive, then you will eventually receive your escrow blessings in time and, of course, also in eternity future. And the ultimate result will be, of course, that the believer who does this will fulfill the plan of God will pass evidence testing, will receive the distribution of his escrow assets, and this will all glorify God to the maximum. Now we're going to begin by looking at volitional assets, production assets, and so forth very, very quickly so that we can get, move on to the next increment in our study. Okay. The, in volitional assets, uh, which we will take a few sub-points on so that we have these things categorically. Uh, the issue is the execution of the will, purpose, plan of God. And this is, the execution of the plan is simply, very simple. You advance from babyhood through spiritual maturity by means of a series of good decisions made on a daily basis. And each time you do, you advance. The accumulation of good decisions is the believer ends up becoming a winner. He knows how to make the proper decisions. And when he becomes a winner, he receives his escrow assets, those which are designed for time. But it is entirely up to your volition, for the volition of the believer determines what he considers the important things in life. What are the priorities of the life of this believer? The positive volition is toward, not toward Christian service, not toward some experience, but toward Bible doctrine and the inhale of Bible doctrine. Your volition will be tested along the way in three areas. The, the principle of uh, providential preventative suffering, uh, which will take place in the first stages of spiritual adulthood. Momentum testing, which take place in the intermediary stages of spiritual self-autonomy. 
and uh, the evidence testing which takes place when you finally reach spiritual adulthood. But all of these are related to one thing, your mental attitude. What is your thinking? You, as you think, that is going to be the, the, the result. The result will be you're building inside of yourself a series of positive volitional decisions. And so use the, using the decider of your own soul, you have the privilege and the opportunity of setting the stage for your receiving of the escrow blessing. In addition to that, how are you going to use your uh, production assets? What are your production assets? Production assets are very, very simple. Remember this. The filling or the control of God the Holy Spirit is the means by which the Christian life is lived. And so, from the source of your volition you are going to make a choice as to whether you are going to try to live the Christian way of life under human energy, under human ability, under human uh, intelligence, or whether you're going to use the omnipotence of the God, the Holy Spirit, in order to accomplish the plan that God has for you. And the production of human energy is human good. And human good is rejected by God. The production of omnipotence is divine good. And divine good is accepted by God and is rewarded by God. Of course, the filling of the Spirit is only possible under the period of time that you're living in your very own palace, which we have talked about previously as the divine dynosphere, the equal opportunity from your predestination. God has given it to you, and it is available for you. You will produce then either a wood, hay, and stubble, which comes from your human good, or you will pr pr produce gold, silver, and precious stones, which uh, is taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. The wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up, and you will be received nothing. Gold, silver, and precious stones will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. The issue under production assets is not what you do. It's who controls you when you do it. Either the old sin nature, which is the production of human good, or God, the Holy Spirit, which is the production of divine good. Now there are at least seven things that will be obvious in the believer's life when divine good is produced. The divine good production will be seen in seven particular areas. First of all, the believer will be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. For God will open the opportunities for you to witness for Him. And what is witnessing? Witnessing is simply providing information from the Word of God to a person whom God the Holy Spirit has prepared for the receiving of the seed which you have. And always remember that it is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, not your uh, arguments, not your great abilities, not your uh, personality. Uh, you can win a lot of arguments and never win souls. The winning of the souls is done by God, and the gospel is the power of God for that. Divine good production, again, also produces a, a work in the local church. Now, we hasten to say that not all work in the local church 
is divine good. Most of it is done on the basis of human energy, human energy of the flesh or old sin nature. Sometimes it's done for the purpose of approbation lust, the lust pattern of the old sin nature, the, the desire for approval. And uh, uh, they do it so that uh, people will be able to approve of them and say what fine Christians they are. That's not the kind of service in the local church. But the believer who is filled with the Spirit will have find some place for him to serve in the body, to, to uh, help the rest of the body of Christ. Sometimes there will be work in Christian service organizations under the filling of the Spirit. But if it is, it will be in the form of some kind of evangelism. Through, uh, it, it may be uh, that he goes to the uh, 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 to the uh, to the world uh, of uh, sports, or he may go to the world of of business people. He may go uh, to the world of prisoners. Uh, there are certain worlds that uh, Christian service organizations may uh, zero in on uh, that would be particularly usable. Uh, for certain uh, people who have backgrounds that fit into those things. Uh, it's sometimes you drive down the road and you'll find that there's a, an organization of Christian truckers. And uh, they're very proud of the fact that they are they're not like the rest of them that write on the back of restroom doors <laughs> uh, the wrong things. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, the, these must never be a substitute for the local church and for learning of doctrine. That's not what they're for. They're for evangelism. Neither are there social clubs causing the believer to become shallow and substituting the organization for the local church. There is a place for Christian service organizations in the field of evangelism. Uh, perhaps uh, Bible societies which do not necessarily consider themselves evangelistic would fit into that same area. Four, missionary activity. Not all believers will be missionaries, but many will be in missionary activities, which is the spiritual gift of evangelism. And very often the spiritual gift of organization for the evangelism results in the formation of the local church. But always remember, it's an independent local church, and the missionary is no more the head of that local church, than, uh, unless he's the pastor, than anybody else. And we must avoid the, 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 the several pitfalls. One is avoid the politics of the country. I'd never be a missionary. i get too involved in the politics of the country. But involve, you can't involve yourself in the politics. You can't involve yourself in crusades in the, in the country. But you must also be very, very careful uh, that you do not your, be, uh, 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 become the, uh, the father uh, of uh, a denomination of churches. Uh, because nowhere has God ever put one man over more than one church. Nowhere. It is not biblical for a more than one person to be over more than one local church. And even if the missionary is training pastors, uh, he trains the pastor, and the pastor is therefore on his own. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, if, if the pastor, uh, if the missionary trains a man who has the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, the bad pastor-teacher has the same resource that any other pastor-teacher has anywhere else in the world, and that resource is not the missionary. It is the Lord and Bible doctrine. That's the source. And he must stick with those kind of things. Five, there is also the area of uh, service to the needy in the community. Uh, there are a number of organizations that do uh, meet needs in a community. There are many ways, many means, but they utilize all of them as a means of witnessing and sharing the gospel with those with whom they also seek to meet physical needs. And the, the, the danger here is to allow the tremendous needs to overcome uh, the great uh, mission, which is to give out the gospel 
uh, to those who are needy. Because whatever else they need, they need the gospel more than they need anything else. Uh, sixthly, uh, specialized function. Now, the specialized function would be like working with uh, the youth or working with uh, like a retired uh, or, or old people for God, youth for Christ, working with the handicapped, uh, whatever it may be, with people uh, whose uh, privileges and opportunities are limited. So this is not a spiritual gift that says you can work with youth, but it's a spiritual gift of, that you use uh, to, and, and you specialize in a certain area uh, that uh, is interest, of interest to you, not necessarily because the, you have a spiritual gift of youth work. That is not the case. You have a spiritual gift that is adaptable depend, uh, to the areas that you're interested in and your personality fit into. And then, uh, in the seventh place, uh, the use of special talents and abilities that God has given to you and interests and uh, it may be the use of drama uh, for evangelism it may be the use of, of uh, literature perhaps you have the ability to to write uh, it may be the use of of science uh, such as uh, uh, the Moody sermons from science a tremendous ministry of utilizing science to open doors uh, for the gospel. Uh, it might be uh, 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 a TV, radio production. But God the Holy Spirit is the author of ingenuity. There is some place of genuine spiritual production available for every believer which is suited to his talent, including, and I hate to put it down, music. No, the only reason I hate to put it down is because they say that most musicians are very temperamental, 10% mental and 90% temper, uh, and uh, they're not very uh, usable. But it's true. There is a tremendous place for music uh, in, the, in the area of the uh, production uh, assets. Then there is a third, and that is the undeserved suffering assets. That is, uh, the fact that God administers some kind of suffering uh, for the purpose of blessing to every believer. See, deserved suffering is discipline. This is undeserved suffering. Every believer will receive some kind of undeserved suffering for the purpose of blessing. Now, this, this is the believer, then, who recognizes these things and who submits to them rather than fights them all the way. The belief, you see, God provided this for you in eternity past. And uh, if you have momentum in your Christian way of life and a Bible doctrine, you recognize the undeserved suffering that God has designed for you, which is there for blessing. And it may be blessing to someone else, uh, personal blessing, blessing by association, blessing by those you touch, but uh, whatever it is, uh, the uh, uh, is to is to utilize the suffering, not to fight uh, under the suffering, not to seek to uh, escape from the the suffering, but rather to utilize it for the glory of God in your life. Uh, and you'll never miss uh, the undeserved suffering uh, if you if you are uh, daily making positive decisions for. Bible doctrine. The fourth area is the invisible impact. Assets. In other words, the portfolio of, of invisible assets provides for the members of the royal family to have uh, an invisible impact on human history. This is far more powerful than any human power as recorded in human history. The personal impact is for blessing by association with the believer who has grown up. It can be done through indirectly or it can be done directly. When I say uh, directly, uh, that is the believer uh, received blessing may directly uh, be a blessing to someone else by maybe he's, if he has uh, something to give, he's able to give 
uh, funds or perhaps he's able to uh, provide uh, uh, jobs or, or some way, he is a, a direct blessing. Indirectly, it is in which uh, the family is blessed or the uh, geographic association or friends or whatever is blessed simply by associating with this believer uh, in the invisible impact that God has. But this is all related to the volitional aspect. Do you use your volition? Do you use your volition to make the most of those things that God provides for you? The personnel assets have to do with your spiritual gifts. Every believer was given at least one spiritual gift at the point of salvation in keeping with God the Father's plan for your life. God the Holy Spirit gave the spiritual gift. This is your part on the team. This is your part in the body, fulfilling the place that God has provided for you. This doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, earning it or deserving it or asking for it, uh, begging God for a certain kind of a spiritual gift. It doesn't have anything to do with your spiritual life. God the Father provides equal privilege, equal opportunity from the computer assets. Then the point is that you function under your spiritual gift, whatever it may be. And uh, there are several listings, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, and Romans chapter 12 are the most extensive list. And it would behoove us just to briefly look for a moment at uh, Romans chapter 12 to get some idea as to some of the spiritual gifts. And there is no list of all of them. God uh, doesn't list all of them. Uh, some will be uh, not listed anywhere. You may have a spiritual gift that is not listed anywhere, uh, but it is definitely a spiritual gift that has come from God. In Romans chapter 12, he, he says in verse 4, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many, many members, have uh, members of the same body, do, uh, do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, are, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, verse 6, according to the grace given to us. And then list some of the gifts. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in por proportion to his faith. Uh, then he goes on to say, in verse 7, if it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. There are just a few of, this, of these gifts that we, hear, we don't hear much about. We hear all kinds of talk about the gifts of tongues and of healing and so forth. But here are the gifts that are very useful. Uh, even the gift of encouragement, uh, the gift of, uh, of, uh, of uh, leadership, uh, and whatever uh, is there. But the effective use of your gift depends upon the personnel asset of the filling of the Holy Spirit. So these are all related together. And then the unique assets deal with the, the three indwellings. The unique assets have to do with the indwelling of God the Father, the indwelling of God the Son, the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. The God the Father's indwelling is discussed in John 14, 23, Ephesians 4, 6, and 2 John 9. Apart from any feeling, apart from any experience, God the Father indwells every believer. His purpose is to glorify His protocol plan. It provides the... Uh, he, his indwelling gives you the assurance that His work in eternity past in providing for you equal privilege and equal opportunity in election and predestination will be carried out. You can count on it. You can be sure that he is the author of your escrow assets 
and he indwells you to guarantee that those escrow assets are on deposit for you. That's why he's dwelling within you. The God the Holy Spirit's indwelling is described in John 14:20, uh, John 17:22 and 23, Romans 8:10, 2 Corinthians 13:5, uh, Galatians 2:20, Colossians 1:27 and 1 John 3:24. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God of the Lord Jesus Christ is the badge of royalty. It is the guarantee of the portfolio of invisible assets that God the Father has you, has provided for you. If they were deposited, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who, uh, with him, and, and he, they, not only were they deposited with him, he is the one who dispenses them to you when you reach spiritual maturity. Uh, uh, the God, the, the, the Son, actually dwelling within the believer. God the Holy Spirit indwelling is described in Romans 8, 11, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, uh, as 6, 19, and 20, and 2 Corinthians 6, 16. He indwells us for the purpose of constructing the temple in which God the Son indwells the believer. Since our bodies are inhabited by the old sin nature, God the Son can't indwell unless God the Holy Spirit builds the temple, and so he builds a special temple inside the believer for the indwelling of God the Son. And uh, uh, God the Holy Spirit uh, then uh, uh, makes it possible for the Shekinah glory, God the Son, to actually indwell the temple of the body of the believer just as God the Son indwelt the, the Old Testament physical temple in the, in the pillar of fire and the cloud, which was the evidence of the Shekinah glory. He also dwells to provide omnipotence when uh, he controls the believer, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We have already discussed the Ephesians 1, 3 to 8, and the five uh, aorist tenses, uh, but it will be coming up into the book. Now, uh, as, we, as we conclude, uh, there are two things that we should understand. One is the uh, Roman numeral four, which is the distribution of our assets. And five is the purpose of our assets. There are four phases in which there is the distribution of some of the portfolio of invisible assets. First of all, at the point of salvation. When you exhale faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are sealed by God the Holy Spirit. When He seals you, you are provided with your computer assets, which were provided in eternity past, but now become a reality in your life. The computer assets of, of election and predestination with their equal privilege and equal opportunity. He provides the beginning of your volitional assets. You start off being positive. Whether you go negative, that's entirely up to you. He also provides personnel assets and the unique assets. All of these things become yours at the point of salvation. So that's the first uh, distribution of your assets. The second uh, phase of the distribution of your assets is during your spiritual childhood. During your spiritual childhood, you will utilize rebound, you will use logistical grace, uh, you will experience from time to time the filling of the Holy Spirit. Anytime you do, it's from the source of your portfolio of invisible assets that God provides for you. The third phase of the distribution of your uh, assets come during spiritual adulthood. When uh, you are daily 
using all of God's provisions, you are daily passing the tests. You are daily adding more assets to your portfolio by means of a continuing series of positive volitional decisions. Then finally, in spiritual adulthood, or pardon me, spiritual maturity, when you finally reach spiritual maturity, you receive your entire portfolio of escrow assets for time They are distributed at that point in time. Now the big question always comes, and that's the final point, is what's the purpose? What, why did God the Father provide for you and for me this fantastic portfolio of invisible assets? Well, let's look at a couple of passages with which we close this particular doctrine. Beginning with Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, tells us that well, putting it together with the other things, we'll just break right in the middle because we've read the passage a number of times, resulting in the praise of the glory of His grace. In other words, the verses 3 through 8 tell us the purpose of these things is for the praise of the glory of His grace. Ephesians 1.12 goes on to say, In order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. God has given all these assets so that we might be for the praise of His glory. Verse 14, Ephesians 1.14, which says, uh, talking about the seal of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession for the release of your assets for the praise of His glory. See, when, when you finally uh, uh, see, experience the redemption uh, of those as God's possession, then God will release your assets. But what's the purpose of the release of the assets? for the praise of His glory. And so we have, we recognize, therefore, that <laughs> pardon me, that the whole purpose of what God has done for us is for the praise of His glory. We're going to uh, very shortly return to Galatians chapter 1, uh, where we will read in verse 4, who gave Himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. The ultimate purpose of your being here on this earth the only reason you have for existing is that you, in your life, should become a window through which the glory of God may be seen. Now, no one can add to the glory of God. We, t we use uh, uh, terms which make it sound like that's possible. <laughs> that is, we talk about glorifying God, living a life that glorifies God, which gives us the impression that perhaps we can add to His glory. But we must understand that there's no way 
that the eternal glory of God can ever be increased or decreased. Nothing can take away from His glory. Nothing can add to His glory. But what happens is His glory is seen. Now, there's a certain glory of God that is evidenced in nature. And many of us who have aesthetic type personalities and appreciation uh, can see those things. Uh, some people have never seen a sunrise. Even if they're up at that time, they've never seen it. Uh, they just uh, are not morning people. They don't see it. And they don't see the beauty of a sunrise or the, the glory of a sunset and, and realize that behind it is, is the, uh, the Heavenly Father. But the, the, the glory of nature uh, as it exists, uh, if you're a fisherman, perhaps uh, when you pull in that 12-pound bass, can you look at it, you think, think of the glory of God. Okay, maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you think of that, the delicious dinner that you're going to have out of it. But I don't know. Uh, if you're uh, uh, a hunter, perhaps it's that magnificent 22-point uh, deer <laughs> that you see out there. Uh, that uh, you. But somehow or other, nature does... Uh, call attention to the Creator. But nothing, nothing in comparison with the life of the mature believer that God blesses on the basis of His grace. For when God blesses you on the basis of His grace, anybody who recognizes it all realizes that you have not done anything to earn it and deserve it. And you're very careful in your life that you take no praise and no glory for yourself, that you realize that you are what you are by the grace of God, that it is uh, the God that has given all of these things so that you may glorify Him. And you are very careful not to take any glory which belongs to Him. And there are people who will uh, take the glory. Uh, there are people who, who uh, do it in a backhanded way. Many fundamentalists, uh, do it in a backhanded way. They have a phony humility in which they uh, put their eyes at half mast, their shoulders rounded, they shuffle their feet, oh, shucks, it was nothing. Uh, give God the glory, but in the meantime, they're saying, tell me more, you know. Uh, but that's not the purpose. Our purpose is to demonstrate the glory of God, that it is, it is uh, uh, He, and, and for that, we turn to 1 Corinthians uh, perhaps the most magnificent passage that you could find on the subject comes to us in 1 Corinthians. Because uh, we have to understand uh, these things. And the more we understand the truth, uh, the more we will uh, open the window to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he begins, of course, by uh, talking about the uh, wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God and foolishness. But he says in verse 26 of chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. And then he goes on, Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So that, verse 29, and again in, in the last verse, 31, so that no one may boast before Him. And then we have these beautiful words in verse 30. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has been made to us wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. See, Christ has been made to us all of these things. And it's because of Him, that's grace, that we are in Christ, and because we are in Him, He has been made to us these things. Verse 31, conclusion, Therefore, as it stands permanently written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Kaukaomai means to glory. Let him that glories glory in the Lord. And so as we 
uh, conclude two verses or two passages. The first one found in Romans chapter 11. As he concludes Romans chapter 11, he says, oh, in verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable. Inscrutable absolutely means totally unknowable. How inscrutable are his decrees and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has given to him and has be, uh, not been compensated? Because all things, that's the uh, portfolio of invisible assets, are from the source of him and through the agency of him and for his purpose. To him be glory for ever. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, a final word of warning. Hebrews chapter 10 is the chapter of warning of the believer. And after talking about the, uh, uh, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, he says in verse 35, Therefore, do not throw away as worthless your confidence, that refers to your continued spiritual advance, and you throw away your spiritual advance by entering reversionism. You enter reversionism by reactor factors in the soul. You react to something or someone. You react to something the pastor says, something that, that is taught, something that you disagree with, and you enter in reversionism, and therefore you cast away or throw away as worthless your confidence. But read on. Do not throw away as worthless your confidence, which keeps on having rich distribution of escrow blessing for you have need of what perseverance that daily positive choice so that when you have done the will of God what is doing the will of God you have fulfilled the protocol plan of God by advancing to spiritual maturity but having done the will of God you may receive the deposit your escrow blessing he deposited for you in eternity past which he has promised so don't have the wrong priorities. Check up on them all the time. Reversionism is insidious and can distract you in a moment of time. And before you know it, you're neutralized. Life is passing you by. And you are failing to utilize the thrilling provisions of God the Father in the portfolio of invisible assets. Well, from there we will move on to, and we're not going to take up Christology but in back in Hebrew, uh, in Galatians 1, 3, uh, we t it talks about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Christology would take us about two years, and so we mix it in with other things. And we're ready then to move on to uh, look just uh, at a word or two there, and then uh, into verse 4, which describes uh, Paul's second leg. Paul, remember... Paul is beginning this epistle for a purpose. And that purpose is to set them up for the twofold approach that he is going to take in correcting them. The first is Paul, an apostle, not from the source of men, but from God. And he then eventually, beginning in chapter 1, verse 11, he's going to defend his apostleship. They have not accepted his apostleship. They've rejected it. They did it one time, but they turned their back on him now because he's not as attractive as the super apostles. That is the, 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 the first leg of his, of his thrust. The second leg of his thrust has to do with the work of Christ on the cross, being our substitute, bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. Uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, in which they have distorted the finished work of Christ on the cross, have substituted for it the work of men, and have come up with a phony gospel. And so Paul is going to attack that. The whole book 
of Galatians depends on chapter 4, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where he begins his, his assault on the, uh, the church by, by laying the foundation of his apostleship and the finished work of Christ, and then he goes into correcting them for the, the errors in which they were involved. They failed to understand he was the teacher, and he, they understand, failed to understand what he was teaching for them. And for our listeners and television audience, we again invite you to write for Galatians chapter 1. I've determined that the first volume will be finished uh, when I finish verse 10. I'll go through verse 10, and then the volume 1 will be finished, and I'll start out volume 2, which will begin in verse 11 and Paul's defense of his apostleship. So we have about a few more verses to go, and we'll begin on those in our next class. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit use these things as a source of encouragement and challenge to believers as we realize that in total equality we stand at the foot of the cross with equal privilege and equal opportunity to receive the fantastic things you have provided for us in eternity past. You want to lavish these things upon us, and I pray that God's people who are listening or here uh, uh, will be aware of these things that they may claim that which belongs to them by continued positive perseverance toward Bible doctrine throughout their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.